Okay, we should get started. Andres, you may approach. <laughs> All right, next up, programmatic advertising. So this could be, th th this will be a very interesting subject. So Andres will tell you more about it, how those ads manage to find us, why and uh, uh, for whose benefit. So uh, just one more service information before we kick off. If you, like yesterday I said, if you leave uh, HIPCON for, for good, please remember to leave your beacons. Also, uh, Q&A will be held behind the blue stage on the HIP space booth. Anders, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> Hello. Um, awesome to see you. So I'm Andras Tori, and today I'll be speaking about programmatic advertising. So this is basically speaking about how the sausage gets made. And when I say sausage, I mean, how does the ad that you see when visiting a specific publisher on the web really find you? How, how come that a specific ad gets to be in front of you? And secondly, um, we're going to talk about the technology side of it, which is there are some pretty interesting things happening behind the scenes making those sausages. Um, so, just to, to first present myself, I'm Andras. I have co-founded a company called Zemanta in Slovenia. Uh, we started in doing personal writing assistance. So kind of um, smart AI stuff to help journalists write. But working with publishers, we eventually ended up in advertising. And speaking about sausages, like whichever way sausages get made, they're still tasty at the end, I think I can say that in Serbia, I think, not that many vegetarians. Um, and the same way in advertising, it is what's keeping open web publishing alive. Uh, so kind of, it's a necessity for now uh, of open web publishing. And eventually, through working with advertising, we got acquired by a company called Outbrain, which is the uh, world's leading premium discovery platform. Basically, if you go to CNN and you see recommendations of what articles to read, that's being served by Outbrain and on many, many other uh, premium sites. So we have kind of very kind of this global view of what's happening with advertising, with publishing, with uh, kind of discovery. Uh, more specifically, the agenda for today is uh, three things. So, what is interesting about programmatic advertising from the technology perspective? Um, then we'll look kind of in a detail of how that ad really gets in front of you. What's the process? And we'll look at the technical challenges that happen that are interested for technologists and the reason why some of the brightest minds work in different companies in this. And there's a spice at the end, some of the uh, more interesting fails in technology that we had that had some real business consequences. Anyway, getting to the point for the tech is why is this interesting? Well, we're handling 300,000 requests per second. Um, and for each of those requests, the maximum processing time is 10 milliseconds. Actually, it's 100, but that includes network round trip. So you have to be at 10 milliseconds, and not on average, but on 99 percentile. So it really is kind of tough technical challenge, and this is at Zementa. For example, at Google, when this happens, it's actually millions of uh, bid requests per second. And the other thing that's interesting on this side is that each request is not just serving some content. Each request might become a financial transaction. So you're dealing with a lot of micro, micro transactions very, happening very quickly, and that can work very quickly. Um, so you have to use uh, machine learning to decide on how you're going to respond to those possible transactions. And because the, the amount of uh, kind of offer transaction is so big, you have a distributed environment and you have to control how money gets spent like in this distributed environment. So you have to have like this central control for things that happen in a really distributed way. So let's now, this is why things are interesting, but let's go back and what's happening when we start opening a web page. So we have a user. User goes to, let's say, MSN, well, what happened here? User goes to msn.com. It's one of the biggest news portals in the US. Uh, and eventually comes to a page where uh, there's content that user was looking for, and there are 
the specific type of advertising that I'll be talking about today, which is kind of native advertising. That's advertising that's not banners, it's more like discovery. And sometimes here, other stories from the same publishers uh, pop up, and sometimes it's kind of paid uh, stories that advertisers have, uh, have placed there. So this, like you open the page, this happens. So how did this happen? How did, did these three particular ads get selected for you particularly? So we'll be, we'll be trying to look at that. But from the publisher's perspective, the question is this. I have written the content and I'll put a few places on my page to be sold. Now, to who should I sell it so I'll get the most money so I could pay my journalists? Um, and the easy answer is, well, you call everybody that's interested, maybe by phone, and ask them how much they would pay. Um, and you basically run an auction. You sell that piece of real estate on the web page to the highest bidder. Um, now, the question is, okay, great, but usually phone calls take some time. How can you do this at scale for basically most of the publishers in the world in real time? Of course, oops, technology to the rescue. Um, so, basically, um, over the last 10 years, around this problem of how will the publisher sell a piece of real estate, the whole ecosystem has evolved. That ecosystem has basically two sides. On one side, you have publishers, you have journalists. Um, they want to maximize their revenues. On the other side, you have advertisers. They want to maximize effect of their advertising, getting their message in front of the person that might be possibly interesting. Now, because this happens um, in real time, there, you have to have a lot of technology in between. And because these two people aren't really aligned in business sense, like these guys want to pay as little as possible, these guys want to get as much money as possible, um, you can't, or it's not usual that you would have one uh, single kind of relationship between this. What happened was that uh, two uh, kind of sides, two technological sides happened. One that is supporting publishers in kind of auctioning off their inventory, and the other that's kind of optimizing for advertisers, um, advertisers' kind of goals, conversion, brand lift, and similar. And uh, we'll talk about how this kind of gets, how the data flows between these parties. And in the middle, um, you have a bunch of kind of marketplaces like you have in, in stock trading or similar, where everybody at the end uh, puts their inventory and everybody can buy. Because, uh, of course, the world is not so binary, a lot of these companies actually play in multiple of these uh, kind of technological uh, products. So, for example, Google has products in all of the verticals for publishers, for advertisers, and in between. While, for example, the Outbrain, the company we're part of, has on one side, um, slightly more on the supply side, and the, on the other, we do the, the demand. We, we at Zementa, uh, our subsidiary, do the demand side, uh, serving the uh, advertisers that want real-time bidding. Um, so let's look about the basic data flow. So um, the publisher puts each page view on auction. So at the end, what's the result of that is that the bid request describing from which IP, approximately from which user agent, so which browser, etc., who's, who's right now trying to view this page, kind of travels to about 100 companies, uh, and those companies then decide, uh, th those companies represent advertisers and their budgets and their campaigns, and in, on their behalf decide on how much they're going to bid. So those companies are called DSPs, demand side provider, uh, demand side platforms. Um, and the DSP evaluates each request, each page view on MSN, um, and figures out I have these five advertisers, or these 500 or 5,000, to whom this request matters the most. Like, is this, has this, is this user currently on the page about cars? I might pick four, et cetera, et cetera. And the end result that what DSP has to give out is, look, I am, in this millisecond, prepared to pay this amount of money to show this specific ad. Basically, creates a bid price, bid, bids uh, in an auction. Publisher then, or publisher's technology platform then, picks the highest bidder and shows that ad. And what's also important, it lets the 
demand side, the advertisers platform know that it has won. Why is that important? Because that means that advertiser is now on the line for paying the money. All this needs to happen, this auction, in 100 milliseconds or less, and that includes network round trips. Um, so to repeat the basic data flow for each page view, and I'm simplifying here a bit because it's not really page view. Usually for each section of the page where the ads are, there's a separate auction. Uh, each page view is evaluated against the campaigns in the systems of this um, DSPs of advertisers. And each page view eventually becomes a very small financial transaction between multiple parties. So you have uh, on one side the publisher, publisher's platform, uh, you have the exchange, you have the, the, uh, the advertiser's platform. So when the ad gets kind of, somebody wins an ad auction, now the quote unquote contract happens between those five parties saying, um, publisher's platform will pay publisher next month 0.002 cents for this. The exchange will pay the publisher platform. The demand side part will pay the exchange, and the advertiser at the end, the final payer will pay the, the advertiser platform. So these are really small amounts, but they end up being uh, the industry, this specific real-time bidding, including display, including uh, this open web kind of tens of billions of dollars a year. So it's a problem worth solving from financial, from business perspective. Um, now that we looked at like, okay, how, how does the business around the, the ad being shown works? Let's take a look at how the technology uh, works or how, what are the technology challenges that um, you need to solve to be in this ecosystem. And we'll look at a couple uh, of different uh, kind of aspects, but by far not all of them. Um, we'll look at scale and performance. Uh, basically, um, how, do you, how do you handle the, the amounts you have? Um, they, we'll look a bit at the interesting question of how do you control spend? So you have uh, hun uh, 100 servers, uh, you have a campaign that can spend $100 a, a day, so each server can spend $1, but the real question is how much can each server spend in the next couple of minutes? And you're at very small amounts and you have to be very careful not to kind of blow the budget and uh, spend the money you don't actually have. Um, all this decisioning has to, to, to work really, really fast, happen really fast. And you need to decide at which price, which ad you want to show. From, I'm talking now from the perspective of a DSP, of somebody representing the advertisers, technology helping the advertiser. To do that, there's some machine learning we'll be speaking about uh, briefly. And we'll talk about a few kind of the most important things that in this system for you as a technological provider must never go wrong. Because if they go wrong, you'll start losing money. Um, let's start with scale and infrastructure. So we already described we're talking about 100 milliseconds with network round trip. So if you want to serve the whole world, you are bound to have uh, server farms, uh, data centers across the world. In our case, at Demanta, we have East Coast US, West Coast US, Europe, and Asia. Um, you might have then separate Australia, you might have uh, more data centers, but you, if you really want to play on a global market, you are forced to be everywhere. Um, and, of course, the, the easy thing is, it's really, like, it's responding to this request is fairly um, parallelizable problem. Each request, you don't need data about a request that came in, in at the same time. You can kind of process it parallelly. So it's great for scaling out. So basically, just rent more servers, and that's that. However, as I described, because you're distributing kind of each server has to know how much it can spend for each campaign, suddenly you're, you're now splitting those budgets and those budgets when they're split up between too many servers might not even suffice for buying uh, all the opportunities for, uh, all the, for participating on all the auctions that are available. So you can scale out, but you're really, really trying not to. Um, so at Zamanta, currently we're at kind of plus 100 servers. We're, we're, we're working in the native part of this 
real-time bidding industry. Native is, as I said, uh, when you get these content recommendations that are, I hope, uh, much friendlier than flashing banners, right? But the whole display ecosystem, it has, as I mentioned, millions of such bid requests, such auctions per second, and you're, you're basically forced into having thousands of servers. Uh, because you want to have as few servers as possible, you want to scale up. But uh, you don't want machines that are non-standard because you want to basically just get more machines in different data centers uh, as quickly as possible. So you basically end up with the biggest machine size that is kind of standardized across um, different uh, data center providers, different uh, rented uh, hardware providers. So, for example, in our case, we end up with 128 gig machines, uh, all SSD, I'll explain later why and how is that used, but you're dealing with quite a lot of infrastructure. Now, on the other hand, we're talking about performance, you can't really do this in Python or Ruby or uh, PHP. I mean, you can if, if, if you want to lose a lot of money because the processing of that request that you, where you might spend 0 0.0002 cents and as a provider, you get some percentage of that, will cost you more than the, the running the PHP code. So you end up with, uh, let's say, these lower level languages. Traditionally, um, those, those are C++ and Java with all its uh, kind of silbings and uh, children. Um, so Scala, uh, Kotlin, I haven't yet seen anybody doing bidding in Kotlin, but anyway. And, and we at Zementa, we were kind of moving into this space, as I said, we pivoted from technologies for publishers like five years ago. And at that time, Golang was just kind of getting um, mature. So we actually placed a big bet on uh, trying out the new language. And I have to say, like, it really paid off in a sense of speed of development, performance, how quickly people get into the code. Uh, Golang is very small language compared to kind of amount of language that Java has or God forbid C++. So um, you, you, your developers can learn it quickly even if they never, they never worked in the language before. Um, and Go, Go is very opinionated language. You cannot have or it's not made to have like gazillion of abstractions which actually helps in this really high performance um, environments where you have to kind of think ahead of what kind of abstractions you really need and what kind of abstractions can you forego in order to have more performance. Um, and so Golang, I can say only good things about it. And at the end, we end up with 10 milliseconds processing time. Now, the first thing is for each request that you get, let's say you have 1,000 campaigns from your advertisers, and each campaign has, let's say, 100 different ads, so 100 different images and uh, text um, and links, and you need to kind of, for 300 times, 300,000 times a second, compare to 100,000 ads or, or millions of ads. You really cannot do that. You, you need to basically figure a way around it. You need to do shortcuts, you need to do heuristics to remove uh, a lot of computing before it even started. Well, I'll talk about a bit more about it uh, later on. But the second thing is, you also need some database queries. And if you have 10 milliseconds, you use like just the variance of, I don't know, SQL or similar, it doesn't really work. You have to have an ultra optimized database that's actually, uh, this database was kind of made for or started in advertising space that has certain properties uh, that are important for you. So the most important property is if you set it up right, you have like almost guaranteed extremely, extremely low latencies in returning the, the, the data. Um, what, what it does, how it's special is that it doesn't run in any other way but having enough memory to have a full index of your database in memory. It crashes if it, uh, if it runs out of memory uh, to, to keep the full index. Well, crashes, kind of stops working. Um, and um, it requires basically to have pure SSD. So it can get you to approximately these numbers at the end. Um, on the other hand, the interesting thing here is that in this database, for example, you save 
uh, user profiles, those that you can save when under GDPR. Um, and it means that if you kind of miss here and there a few and you don't get a response back or something's happening, it's not end of the world. This is not the, the, the database in which you keep your uh, transactions in terms of monetary transactions. So it has a different constraints. It's a bit more, hey, it has to work fast, but it can actually sometimes drop a bit of data or it can drop uh, um, for a second or so. So um, this, this database doesn't get very good um, uh, kind of evaluations on the consistency and atomicity and similar tests, but it's really useful in advertising. Um, let's go on. So these are kind of interesting performance tidbits with which we are um, working. Um, now, the second uh, the thing I was mentioning was spend control. So you have $100 campaign, 100 servers. Each server can spend $1 per day. Um, and you need to figure out how much you can spend in the next minute or so. And you solve this by try, trying to smartly kind of really allocate money to servers. You know, if the campaign targets Europe, the allocation to your North American servers of money for that campaign probably doesn't need to be that large. <coughs> so you can, um, you can kind of just allocate it to the right servers. At the same time, to make things trickier, so you submit a bid. Uh, I'm willing to pay 0 0.001 cent for this ad to be shown. You don't immediately get the response whether you have won or not. So you only get the response if you have won. If you have not won, you don't get a loss notice. So you kind of have to figure out and model like with different partners, how long should you assume that the money is on the line and when you can say, oh, obviously we didn't win. Um, and it's a quite, quite interesting uh, problem to have. Again, you're dealing with money, but on the other hand, probabilistic uh, accounting in a way. Um, and uh, it's, it's tricky and when you fail, you pay. Um, so it's how you solve this problem at the end is kind of centralization um, where each server is constantly kind of pinging, hey, can I, I, I'm, seeing, uh, I, I'm seeing I could bid on this campaign, can I get a bit more allocation of money so I can shell it out and I'll see what happens. Uh, at the same time, this, the other centralized thing is obviously what campaigns do you have. You have a dashboard where advertisers enter their, their campaigns, their targeting, etc. And that works in the same way. Basically, machines, the, the bidder notes, as they are called, constantly every minute down, are downloading deltas that are centrally prepared. And of course, all that, you, you usually cache them in each data center, etc. cetera. Um, oh yeah, uh, behind this, like the, the, the money part, there is a Postgres database. Um, now, we already talked a lot about this bid request like in abstract, but let's look at, um, since we're at the tech conference, um, how does the bid request, the simplified bid request, really look like and how uh, a DSP would respond to it? So here's the kind of shortened version. Usually it happens in JSON or a binary version of it. And it basically includes first what kind of impression is on offer. Uh, it tells you, okay, this is native impression, so basically this recommendation unit. And uh, here it would say, that there, it would be too much data, but it would say, this unit will have an image that is 200 by 200. It can have the title that is at maximum 150 characters long. And it also has a description of what, what's in this ad that can be 300 characters long. So you get to know this, and then if you have ad that, is, uh, that doesn't fit because the text is too long, you have to filter it out. You also get like bit floor. Like if, if you're not willing to pay this much, then don't even try. Like I'm not willing to, to sell for less than this amount. Then you start getting this uh, data about what page view is actually going on. So for example, you, you have a site, and like, this is kind of a viral news site, Guilty Fix, and it says somebody's reading something about unique mixed bread dogs, and the publisher, who's the, the business entity behind this site, is in this case boredom, boredom therapy. Of course, you will use this information, the page, when you will be doing the targeting, contextual targeting, and similar. Then. So this is what user is looking at. Then the second thing is, what device is user using to look at this thing? Uh, usually you get a user agent, 
which you then translate into a device. So you know it's, it's mobile device, it's tablet, it's desktop. Uh, you get to know which browser it is. Maybe it's, in, it's uh, inside a kind of app browser or it's Chrome, etc. cetera. Um, you get the IP, but this is actually the old slide. Lately, you don't actually get the full IP because we have GDPR and the world is getting a better place by uh, anonymizing this data. And you get basically zero here. But you still, you're able to use this information <coughs> to decode geo. At least for, for desktop, for, for mobile, it's a bit trickier. But you can, you can usually, uh, you infer this. You, you get into the request, but really you infer this because you never trust the upstream. Um, I'll explain why later on. Um, and at the end, if in Europe you have a consent from the user, you actually get to know the user ID that you can then compare to your database and see, oh, this user was just looking at uh, rooms for rent in Belgrade. I'll do the retargeting campaign for him or similar. Um, so this is how the bid request looks like. There's more, uh, more data, but this, these are the, the core data which you can then use to, to make a decision. And this is how you respond in native. Um, so you first say, okay, I'm willing to pay 1.75, la, la, la. This is kind of a big number, but in advertising, usually we do everything by CPM, which is 1,000 of it. So you actually divide this by 1,000 if you want to know how much we're willing to pay for this specific page. You. Um, then in, in old school display advertising here, it would be just one big HTML blob. And uh, nobody, not even the publisher, would know what's in there. Um, the, the advertiser would kind of have even a flashy banner or something. And it's really hard to control quality in this kind of ecosystem. So in native, kind of the more modern version of display ecosystem, actually the advertiser doesn't just give a blob out to a publisher. What it does is it specifies assets that will, uh, that will kind of be assembled into an app. It specifies, this is the, the ad about how to travel safely with your body. Body in this case means dog. Um, and then there is a description, what happens when you bring your pet along for the ride. And if you're interested in that, you'll click it. There's an image that should get rendered, uh, what the size of the image is, uh, who's the, so, to display to the, to the user, like, who are you, you being led to if you click on it? So this is, again, a thing of native advertising that I believe is better than display advertising. You always get like small text of, if I click here, which company page will I end up on? Um, and also the advertiser. Uh, now, the, the publisher might display this or this, depending on how they set up their, their ads. And of course, click URL. <coughs> This is important because if the user clicks, um, we as a DSP that are optimizing for advertiser success want to know and we want to show more ads where users are clicking versus where users aren't engaged with, with the ad we're showing. So in this case, Allstate is basically an um, insurance company, one of the largest insurance companies in the US, and they're promoting this article because at the end they're probably saying, oh, you should do this, this, and this if you, you have a dog in your car. But if you want to insure your car for dog damage, we can sell you this product, right? Um, there's a domain. This is kind of the identifier, the, the programmatic identifier of the, public, of the advertiser. So if publisher says, I never want to show any ad from Allstate anymore, they just list like, don't show me any, any ads from a domain. Um, and at the end, this is N URL, which means which short for notification URL, which is if this, you, you submit this back to the exchange as a DSP, as a representative of the advertiser, and say, if I win, if I'll be spending this money, call this URL. Um, and you put usually a lot of things in this URL because you, have, you, you try to not have stateful data. So everything you need to process the fact that you have won the, the, um, the, the auction, you put it in here so you don't need to have memcache or something that persists for a couple of seconds uh, to, to decode, to get you other info that you need. And at the end, there's the micro that gets filled in by the, by the uh, exchange or the, the SSP, so publisher's technology, which tells you how much you will have to pay because you put in the bid, but the 
auction is second price auction, so you pay as much as the second uh, bidder uh, uh, was offering. This is because of auction dynamics, so everybody uh, are truthful, but that's for some other time. Anyway, so we've now looked at the, um, how the request looks like, with what the, the pre representative of advertiser responds, and what's the decisioning process of getting from the request to response? So inputs are, as I said, page URL, IP, user agent, cookie ID, etc. Outputs have to be, I'm bidding this much with this ad, and this ad is kind of assets. Um, so the, the assets are also good for a kind of quality control. Now people can review them. There, there's a whole ecosystem trying to improve the ads and review them, etc. Anyway, you get this request in. The first thing, of course, as I said, heuristics. You quickly filter out all ads that don't fit this request. So if you have, um, uh, if, uh, you have an ad that requires image that's really big, like 1,200 by 1,200, you quickly kind of discard all ads. You don't need to know anything about whether they would perform. If they have the image that's like just 300 by 300, it cannot be there. Um, and you do other, other stuff like fraud prevention to also kind of remove requests. You also do, uh, you ignore requests that are coming from VPNs, etc., because you don't know, for example, the real geo, or you don't know if it's really a human or a bot. The, so you end up with kind of short list of ads. So from 100,000, you end up with 100 ads that already kind of fit the criteria in terms of targeting. So uh, the main criteria usually is geographical targeting. Um, so that's country, region, state, city. Device targeting, that's um, mobile, desktop, tablet. Also, whether it's in-app, we're, we're not speaking about in-app today. We're just web, but that's also part of it. Um, and th those are kind of the main targeting, and then there is this cookie targeting, retargeting that you see uh, that uh, some companies use very successfully. For those 100 now, you can afford to do a bit more of machine learning or evaluation of machine learning, and you try to estimate what's the chance of you going to MSM page um, about uh, cute animals, what's the chance that you'll be interested in our ad about dog traveling in cars. Um, now, I'll, I'll speak in, a bit in next slide about that, um, how you do that, but this is a bit more intense calculation. Uh, then you do a very simple thing, in, again, in, this is maybe a bit special native. People like to pay by click, so by performance to a degree, not by just, so advertiser says, I, I want to pay like 30 cents per click. I don't want to pay for, uh, for um, just viewing of the ad. So you, you basically figure out what the price would be if your estimate was correct. Uh, and then you pick the, the highest bit and push it forward. Now, when you push it forward, you also need to get all this data as quickly as possible to your machine learning system. Now, why is, uh, why is this important? Because there are two different kinds of machine learning kind of problems in the world. Uh, one are where you have basically lots of data, you can afford to spend a lot of time crunching it, and you create a model, and now this model is going to predict whether there, there are dogs or, or cats on the picture, or something similar, or do, um, do uh, voice recognition or something like that. That's called kind of offline uh, machine learning. You have time, you can learn, you create a model, and then you keep using the model for all the new images, new decisions that you have to make. Um, in real-time bidding, you actually have to adapt really, really quickly. There is a new page up on MSN that's not about dogs, but about cats. You need to figure out as quickly as possible, will people still react to the ads about driving a dog in a car? So you need to kind of close that loop in a matter of minutes, not days. Um, so you need frequent updates, which kind of make deep learning uh, out of the question, despite being the most successful AI the machine learning method uh, currently. Um, and second, you, need, you want to have fast evaluation, so not a huge model. Um, possibly partial evaluation, so you can do it in steps, because, for example, when you're evaluating um, the, some page and uh, device and ads, you can calculate the device part, which is the same for all ads, and then kind of join with the, the more specific calculation of expected click-through rate based on the ad. So in practice, for those that are a bit more interested in machine learning, the logistic regression was kind of the workhorse of uh, 
display advertising, native advertising. Uh, it's a very kind of simple and amazingly effective method. Uh, different versions of some Bayesian versions and similar were in use. And then currently there's this thing uh, which are factorization machines. If you're in this space or similar uh, machine learning where you need kind of simple, relatively simple methods to get you good results quickly without extremely long pipelines like deep learning, you, I recommend you look at this uh, um, area of science. For, it came out like the last couple of years, or the last couple of years it got into production. Now the biggest, it seems like nobody really says what they have in production, but at least they're uh, publishing uh, scientific articles, have uh, managed to use uh, uh, neural networks, usually not deep models, usually uh, shallow models that kind of then combine uh, other uh, simple models like uh, uh, gradient boosted trees, etc. Uh, since this is not data science conference, I won't go into the details of all. Um, but if someone's interested, happy to, to, to geek out on it afterwards. Um, and then at the end, <coughs> as I said, some of the most important business to technology things never lose a win notice. So you might bid on a thing, but now your server falls down and the, the exchange wants to tell you, hey, you have won, you are now on the line to pay 0.002 cents, a lot of times per second. Uh, if you lose that, you say, okay, great, we have spent the campaign, we have spent this campaign, it worked great, we spent $10,000. And then at the end of the month, the exchange comes and no, 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 you own us $30,000. Like, what happened? Well, I don't know, maybe you weren't noticing that we were sending you win notices, and that's your problem now, so you're on the line for it. So how do you solve it? Like, sometimes the simplest methods are the best, at least to start with. Um, and you, can, you, you have fail modes with network goes down, hardware goes down, your program crashes, kind of three levels of things that go, go wrong in this uh, setting. And we went for this, uh, at the beginning, like, you don't have many people, simplest and safest. Start writing to a file, uh, it will, and then kind of have separate process to upload it, especially because OS kind of leave the to OS to persist it. Um, unfortunately, this is not uh, full, fully real time, so we're currently moving to Kafka as much things as possible. Um, some topics before going to fails, which is the last part, some topics I haven't covered but would have a separate speech each fraud prevention. $10 billion, tens of billions of dollars a year. You can imagine there are people that want to uh, kind of get to it in, in illicit ways. Uh, kind of making sure that you never go beyond CPC despite that you bid in CPM. Conversion optimization. Advertisers don't really want clicks. They want some kind of actions. Uh, user tracking. Never miss a click. <laughs> Similar like, um, like with uh, win notices. And you have massive amounts of data that you need to keep analyzing and bring to the, um, to the dashboard at the end. So two last things, fails, as I promised. So the first thing is load balancing. You have lots of servers, you need to do load balancing. Uh, Amazon gets really expensive. We don't use Amazon for this frontline serving, also um, for uh, elastic load balancer. So we have round robin, what on? What could possibly go wrong, right? Well, you, you're working just with 50, 50 companies that call your servers, but some of those companies also want to optimize their software and thought that it's a great idea to not honor TTLs, so time to live on DNS, and kind of cache DNSs for a month. So you, you move the servers around and they still keep sending requests to, the, to your non-existing servers. To be more fun, somebody else got those IPs by then. So they're sending, sending those requests to some other company that says like, who's, we're at the final one, um, counting money. So best practice, counting money in millions of dollars, in, in one millionth of a dollar. Don't use floating point. If somebody works in banking, you know, you never use floating point. So the industry standard, but the win price that comes back is a string. You need to parse it. Um, however, we tried using uh, Golang rational number. It's really slow. Uh, decimal wasn't available. So we wrote, we use our own int 64 fixed point notation and we wrote our own parser. What can possibly go wrong? Um, well, 
We used all the Golang unit tests, so it's really well tested. Parser for parsing floating point, you get a string, you want a fixed point in uh, 64. Well, somebody thought that maybe they'll switch to double and just have a lot of zeros and ones uh, in the same floating point number. Suddenly, you're trying to parse something and get an overflow. Suddenly, you start counting less money than, than it is, and this lasts for weeks. It's not as bad as parsing XML uh, with uh, regular expressions, but still don't write your parsers in Golang if you don't want to lose money. Don't want write your own float parsers. We have one to sell if somebody needs it. Um, and that's basically all. Uh, thank you very much, and <laughs> hope, hope to answer more questions afterwards. <laughs>